I am the CEO of NHS. NHS is my company. I founded it over four years ago. Uh, and we're an organization that specializes in improving the patient experience and the customer experience in the healthcare sector. What I'm very excited to talk to you about again today is that we talked about mindset and emotions. Really, we've evolved this 6E framework to help organizations uh, understand the emotions of their customers and how to innovate from there. So a little bit about Energet. Uh, we were founded in 2012, and we work with organizations around the world. We've got a world-class team. We've got 15 people, so it's quite a small elite team. And we actually work with the healthcare sector uh, across these different countries. The disconnect between the customer's perception of anything you do in your business and how you perceive what you do in your business can be a massive gap. Customer experience is really the sum of all the interactions that you have with the customer right now. Now, there's definitions here around its attraction, awareness, discovery, etc. It is before the customer buys from you. It is when they've already bought your product and it is after they've left your product or service. That whole journey is the customer experience. It is measured by the experience along all points against the expectations. So what did Gartner say? Gartner said 50% of companies will be investing more in customer experience. The Customer 2020 report said customer experience will exceed price and product as the main differentiator. So the way the generations, the way society is moving at the moment, we're going to play so much more on how the service that you're getting rather than the price of the product. You're probably doing some things like customer satisfaction, customer service, net promoter score, consumer engagement, patient engagement, feedback, surveys, qualitative research, quantitative research. This is how you're probably referring to customer experience right now. But why are consumer expectations, why are your expectations changing? The internet. It is about access to comparison, right? So if you want to look at a product, if you're buying a product right now, you go into Google, you Google the name of the product, you're able to find the best thing out there in the world right now. You can compare products and services just by Google. If you want to compare prices, you get onto eBay, you compare prices, and immediately you know if the price you're getting is good or not. Good or bad experience. Expectations in your mind changing. So it's not just that we have access to information, we have far more access to comparison. And because of our usage of mobile, we're actually comparing so much faster than you ever did. What does that mean? Your customers' expectations are changing very quickly. So what's happening? What's happening in the world that you live in? Customer expectations are going up very quickly. Your businesses are largely staying stagnant or improving at an incremental pace. In the minds of your customers, your brands are declining. And that customer experience gap is growing so much faster. Does that make sense? because we're just getting so much more comparative information. And the generations coming through, Gen Y, the millennials, this is inbuilt into the DNA. So as soon as they see something that they like, boom, get out the mobile. Now in healthcare, which is the industry where I spend most of my time, we don't want products anymore. We don't want just the drug. We want more. I want you to empathize with me. I want you to meet me where I am. I don't want to go and see the doctor, you know, the specialist, which is 20 miles away. Bring the specialist to me. Nurture me, help me throughout that whole health journey and make it easy for me to access my care. These are some of the things that consumers like you are wanting from healthcare. Bain says 80% of companies believe they deliver a superior customer experience, but only 8% of customers agree. The gap, according to the evidence, is wide and possibly getting wider. Einstein, big role model, said we can't solve the problems of the past with the same level of thinking that created them. The way you think right now has to change in order for you to really deliver a different kind of it, to solve this problem in your business. And so we introduced the 6E framework really to help companies form that progress because in doing a lot of work, doing the analytics, understanding where customers are coming from and the way the world is going, we need a different frame and a different paradigm that's more authentic than what we have now. So this framework really looks at the experiences. Uh, it's a 60 framework, emotions, the energy of the organization. Execution and excellence is a lot about what you're talking about so far to lead to a more evolu to 
a greater evolution. Building capability in your organization, strategic capability, such that you deal with your customers in a different way. So let's talk a bit about experience. Typical business hears from about 4% of its dissatisfied customers. By and large, companies don't really care. But it's not so much that you don't really care, it's that you're just missing the feedback. You're not actually collecting and analyzing the feedback. It's all about the feedback. That's where the best ideas come from. The other part that most companies miss is mapping the whole journey. So when we look at, for example, with health insurers, and they're trying to fix the customer experience, they're just looking at the part where the claim is made, and they're missing the whole customer journey. And so a lot of your organizations are now trying to fix that part of the process where you deal with them, and you don't really give a rats about what's going on in their world. It's time to actually map the whole journey, because the best solutions come from an understanding where do your customers currently go before you, and where do they go after you? And trying to create a solution with those. So capturing experience means collecting data along that whole journey. Now, some of you do focus groups. Some of you have one-on-one -on -one conversation with frontline employees. And so when we go into companies and we solve their problems, we do two things. We talk to the CEOs and the executive teams about what they think the problems are. Then we go right down to the front line and talk to the nurses, the frontline staff, and ask them what the problems are. And you get two different stories. And it's only when you match those two that you actually get the real solution to the problem. Surveys, I'll talk a bit about that. Call center voice recording, customer emails. A lot of people don't analyze that. We heard a story from Kathleen earlier about collecting patient stories. That's great. You can go, you can do your focus groups and all that. But now we're in the world of big data, and all those stories are already online. They're already talking about you on the various websites. So Amazon, Whirlpool, some of the work we do, we do analysis of comments on these websites. Right, and get that raw feedback. Once you can understand why people are frustrated with your services, that's when you get real solutions that are far more cost effective than what you're doing now. I'll give you an example at a hospital. We've got a platform, a software platform called MES. Ask quantitative questions. How likely are you to recommend our ward to your family and friends? But this is where the world is going. This is where the gold is. It's when you start collecting the free text and you start collecting the stories and the narratives that you get the real deep insight on how to solve the problem. Create your new product or service, innovate. When you have the customer experience that doesn't meet your current expectation, you have a deficit, people get angry, people get frustrated. When the experience is better than your current expectations, then you have a satisfaction profit, people get excitement, people get delighted. So how does that work? Comes to the second E, analyzing the emotions. How do you feel about your current experience? Because I can tell you right now, you'll do business with people you really like. You feel good when you're around them, you'll do business with them, you'll buy the products. How many people use net promoter scores, NPS? So it's not what you think about them, it's how they feel about you. How do we do it in a complicated world where you're getting tons of data, lots of stories, conversations online about your products and services? Sentiment analysis is all about analyzing emotions. Right now where the world is at is a lot of sentiment analysis tools can tell you um, the positive words and the negative words from the feedback that come about your companies. This is one particular tool that we use. It's called Pensensic. It was actually invented by Daryl. Daryl Mann uh, was one of the inventors of this particular. He went and spoke to uh, hundreds of CEOs and asked them, look, I've done innovation for 20 years, and if you could solve problems in your company, what would you like to know? He said, look, we can get the sales figures, we can get the profit figures, we can go all these things. But what I want to know is the soft stuff the water cooler conversations, the culture. When are people getting frustrated before they leave? And so he developed this tool to really break down the emotions running through people's words in the feedback. And so you can see the anger, the frustration, the happiness, love. And so when you want to solve the problem in the service, you dig deep into what's frustrating customers. When you dig deep into the frustration, we don't actually look at the anger. From our analysis, we show when people make angry comments, when they use swear words and all that, not very useful. But when you get into the frustrated people that are still engaged with your product or service, that's when you get some real great ideas. This is an example of a breakdown. This is how deep we get into all those stories. We can also measure delights. What's delighting your current customers and break it down into specifics. Is it the behavior of your staff? Is it the competency? Is it the response time, et cetera? And in healthcare, we can now measure compassion. One of the things we know, if you ever go into hospital, what you really care about is was a nurse kind to you, was the doctor nice to you? Uh, how important was that? Well, now we have an objective measure. We can actually analyze all the feedback from patients in that hospital and actually measure that on a quantitative scale and trend that over time to see whether all that 
nurse training, doctor training, communication skill training is actually working in the organization. We do it for businesses as well. We're able to measure the communication levels. This is one lens, positive versus negative communications, as judged by your customers. The third is around energy. Once you do that analysis, what's the energy of your culture in your organization like? We talked a lot about tools, etc. The energy of an organization is really, the cult really around the culture. But we use many words. A lot of you know, academics say the creativity, the authenticity, the compassion, the love, the joy. Now you might say, I have no love or joy in my work. Well, that's where you're going wrong. That's where you're going wrong. And I think, you know, as much as you want to introduce skills, tools, processes to improve, this is where the heart of business will go in the future. The Japanese call this term the ikigai, and that is we all have a purpose. In life, we all have a purpose. There is a meaning to our lives. And for every employee that you have is a human being that probably has meaning to their lives too. How do you come to understanding your ikigai and your purpose? You only have to answer four questions. This won't take you very long, but I strongly recommend you do this. The first question is, what do you love? What do you really love doing? Okay. Or what do you love doing in your life? The second question is, what are you good at? Some of you have done the strengths work from Gallup. You've done tools from Martin Seligman and all that. That's where this comes in. What are you good at? The third is, what can you get paid for? What can you get paid for to do? And you need to challenge yourself. Can you really get paid to do something else that's different? And last, what does the world need? What does the market need? that you, personally you, not your company, but you can satisfy, okay? When you line up all these four things, you will come to where you can get the greatest level of achievement that's authentic to you. And so if you are not in this space, I can tell you, you sit in one of these other spaces that you're probably not performing at your optimal best. I know when I was at Pfizer, I was good. But now that I'm at NHS running living my ikigai, my purpose, I'm at my best. And I'm hoping that I'll get better as I understand myself greater and greater. The same goes through for every human being that's an employee, a team member, or a boss that you currently work with. The same for your customers as well. I'm going to skip E4, E5, and just go straight to the last one, and it's about evolution. So Barbara Khan, professor of marketing from Wharton Business School, said, firstly, your company start off with a product orientation. I look at lots of pharmaceutical companies. They're still at that space. You got one product, you sell it. All the budgets are aligned to product. Then you become a bit more evolved, and you go to a market orientation. You go, what are all the products that cater to that demographic of women aged between 50 and 65. You become more market oriented. But then you start to become aware of the customer experience. You start to become aware of its importance and you know that you need to deliver a positive customer experience to keep those same customers. I can see most pharmaceutical companies are not there yet. But finally is to become in a space of authenticity where customers actually connect with the soul of your brand. They naturally connect with you on the long-term basis. Look at Firms of Endearment. This is a very good book around being more authentic. What the authors did in Firms of Endearment is compare these 18 firms, which they called firms that demonstrated behaviors of love, joy, authenticity, track them over a 10-year period, and compare those same companies against um, against the good to great companies from Jim Collins's book. And what's really interesting is when they measured those behaviors and prospectively followed those companies over a 10-year period, they found that S&P companies over 10 years grew 122%. Jim Collins, good to great companies, grew 331% on the stock market over a 10-year period. But those companies that showed that behavior of love, compassion, joy, etc., over a 10-year period showed 1,026% in this study. Not many people know about this study, right? But it is in this book. It's called Conscious Capitalism. I strongly recommend you read it because a lot of you are currently missing the point and you need to get it. This is where the real massive growth happens. What I'd like to encourage you to do is really just have a think about the experience that you currently deliver, but more importantly, what's your purpose? When you go back home today, what do you really love doing? Because you can tell your customers, you can train your staff, you can give them processes and systems and tools. But if they're not ultimately in their full authenticity, they cannot tailor that experience for every individual. It really comes back to what's in their heart and how they care about people.